and tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Welcome, dear listener, to Fear from the Heartland. I'm your host, Paul J. McSorley. Set aside some moments now and take an adventurous ride on a journey into the psyche of some talented writers. They will dig into your being and titillate you. Oh, I love that word, titillate. While the stories may not all take place in the heartland, I am delivering them to you from the heartland. My intention is to strike fear and confusion into the mind, soul, and yes, the heart. This is Fear from the Heartland. It is the smell that Daiquiri notices first. A sour odor, not quite spoiled, but rather acidic, wafts through the air. It joins the thick artificial popcorn butter and the sucrose of cotton candy to make a nauseating maelstrom of humidity which permeates through the Florida marsh. The colors come second. Baby blue orchids and ruby red roses poke out from the specimen's flesh, crawling to the sun as if to scream repentance. The stalk of a sunflower sprouts in the center of the creature's brows, bursting upwards and opening great yellow leaves to hug the world. That is what Daiquiri calls it. A creature, or specimen. The words are interchangeable. But it had hopes and dreams, however small and limited it would be, to be found living in a muggy and dragonfly patrolled town carnival in some forgotten Floridian town. The flowers sprouting from its body stretch into a rotting bed that is approximately eight feet long. The creature has been pulled apart, perhaps from the vines that cling to its separated torso and waist, like the strings of a marinette. Or perhaps the vines came separately. The skeleton has long since decomposed beyond recognition of even gender. Even its clothes have been absorbed by the moss and brought into the marsh. What remains of its jaw hangs off on a hinge with the opening of the mouth filled with dirt occupied by fungi that is not native to this humid climate. The hollows of its eyes are covered in moss, like a double eye patch. Daiquiri takes out a hanky and wipes his brows of sweat. He rolls up his sleeves and reaches into his pocket for a cigarette. He loosens his tie, ignites the tobacco in between thin lips, and walks away from the creature to survey the open marsh that expands into a full square mile. Lichen and frogs swim to the surface, and in the deep, probably a crocodile or an alligator. Daiquiri always gets them confused. He hears the crunching of his partner's boots before she announces herself. Daiquiri already has a cigarette waiting for her. No thanks. I promised Sophia I'd stop. Margot said. Cutting out bourbon too? Margot smirked. How do you think we met? Daiquiri looks out to the marsh, stifles a smile at his partner. Small towns like this give me the creeps, says a detective in a state with mainly marshland. He closes his eyes and forces the strange specimen's presence out of his mind. A lemonade mixer buzzes for no one. Hamburger wrappers and plastic hot dog containers move like tumbleweeds in the muggy wind. The rickety Ferris wheel peeks from over the trees, carriages dangling in the sky like forgotten Christmas ornaments. Figures dangle out of the bars. Limbs hang at odd angles. Daiquiri cannot make details, but he does recognize the difference between long arms and short ones. He wonders if any bodies are slumped against the base of the wheel, and if any have skulls broken from impact during a botched attempt to escape from the highest carriage. He wonders if these people even knew that death was upon them. For some reason, the alternative makes him more anxious. He fears that whatever force has befallen the fair is invisible, elusive, that the people did not understand the madness or could not comprehend it. Maybe, Daiquiri counters to himself, maybe that is more of a blessing. Margot looks over her shoulder. Her thick black hair is matted against her forehead, shiny with sweat. 
Her hair is put up in a knot that had once looked professional, but now was as unkempt as Dacry's own five o'clock shadow. She is smarter than Dacry in the temperature department. She keeps her blazer in the car and rolls up her sleeves. Dacry slings his blazer over his forearm. He is getting tired holding it. I try to find some water, but I don't think that's a good idea, she says. I'd rather drink the marsh, Dacry says. He flicked the cigarette into the dirt and crushed it with the heel of his boot. They walk through a cluster of empty tents and stalls. Stuffed animals cling to the wall behind a stacked row of bottles, never to be claimed by a child who can knock each bottle down with a slingshot. Grills of burnt sausages hold a collection of burnt hot dogs that look like scabbed fingers. Ice boxes containing beer have lost all their ice and become pools of warm muggy water. The paper labels long since peeled and floated to the top. The counters are sticky with spilled lemonade and cola. The two detectives approach a strength test with the meter broken. Daggery bends down and examines the mallet. He looks up at the meter and wonders if he could ever pass the test and ring the bell. He never could. He nudges the mallet with the butt of his pistol, afraid to touch it. The moss is dark red, the color of blood, and covers a portion of the face of the mallet. It looks almost like the point of impact, like it had been used as a weapon. A bead of sweat trails down the bridge of his nose and falls on the moss, erupting a froth of gurgling foam. It sizzles like a chemical burn before receding back into the moss, leaving a sweat-drop-sized mark of black against the red. Daiquiri. Margot calls from around the corner. You've got to check this out. He follows her voice and rounds to a dunk tank. The water is dark green with a layer of algae clinging to the sides and skimming to the top. Dandelions and tulips pop out like ribbons. The platform above the tank has collapsed. In the briny water, a silhouette lay in stasis, suspended in the icor, arms outstretched. The algae creeps over the edge of the still water, moving like clawing fingers over the metal bolted rim of the tank. The sign above is blanketed by a thin layer of sediment and scum and hangs diagonally. Words written in algae with as much precision as a marker to a whiteboard grows from the splintered wood. Rejoice, repent, revive. The world accepts palms up to the sun, the hands of the moss prophet. Daggery notices that Margot is holding her pistol before he notices that he has instinctively gotten his out as well. He sets his coat on one of the red and white draped picnic tables. The dunk tank stretches away from them, the shadowy figure floating blissfully in its moss-blanketed womb. Beyond, near the edge of the marsh and the entrance to the carnival, the specimen lay succumbed to the earth. They strafe along the paths, hearing the crunching of sand underneath their boots. Empty stalls box them in, cash registers and tip jars with soggy bills. Scabs of algae start on corners and crept onto folding plastic chairs. Dandelions pop up from random spots on the ground without any dirt or fertilization. Purple orchids and azure tulips cling to the tops of torn tents like barnacles. The Porto Johns are covered almost entirely with a thin layer of algae that creeps from the ground. Blue and orange petals line over green fuzz. The doors are welded shut with spongy ichor, and occasionally their heels give in to some surrendering of the land as if softened by invisible rainfall. The Ferris wheel looms above the trees, the carriages swinging vacantly in some higher wind. The slumped figures are still shadowed with distance, but Daiquiri can now make out details of arms hanging limp through metal barriers, of foreheads pressed in between the gaps. I don't like this place, Daiquiri, Margot says, her eyes darting from the fuzzy Porto Johns. Me neither, he puts his back to hers, keeps his fingers on his gun. Beads of sweat trail down Daiquiri's back. Beyond them, the wind rustles. He feels the eyes of the dung tank drifting towards him, bobbing in some contaminated womb. The specimen is far away now. He wants to submit to the psychic, unexplainable sense that the flowers sprouting from the creature's brows, thighs, forearms, follow him as they would the sun. He wants to. It will be easier. The moss prophet, Margot says. She repeats. The moss prophet? Sounds like a cult, Daiquiri says. He does not know why they stopped here. In the middle of the designated Portageon zone, 
but they did. He kicks away a baseball cap. Empty plastic cans of lemonade and hamburger wrappers litter the grounds, each their own biome of infectious moss that wiggle all its fibers in the beating sun. The trash cans, previously overflowed, have been absorbed entirely by the land and now stick up like totems of seamless carpet, rounded lumps threatening to pierce from the mud like a zith. The ferris wheel reaches into the sky. A door opens with the sound of shredding paper. A figure flops out like a fallen broom. Margot aims, fires. Birds escape from the trees and into the clouds. Daiquiri swears he notices their feathers dipped in what appear to be dark green tar. Margot gestures to Daiquiri and they walk across the court. She takes position next to an overturned trash can that is blanketed by wriggling algae, switching gaze to the other doors. The figure is in Daiquiri's iron sights and he knows from the sudden hissing of gas akin to a deflating balloon and the pungent sour smell of rotting vegetables that whatever this creature is seems to be either a mannequin or halfway to becoming a specimen. He knows for certain that it is not human. Not anymore. It slumps into the foliage, its nose pressed into the dirt. Its skull is half caved in with an indent from the bullet. It looks like a stone pierced a rotting pumpkin. It is hairless and green, and in the shine of the Floridian sun, it seems to glisten with a caked layer of sweat. Its features, half buried, are either absent or transformed. The dimensions of a normal nose have been reduced to something upturned and skeletal, the eyes poking out purple and yellow orchids in full bloom. Moss creeps from the darkness of its lungs and lines the roof of its mouth clawing upwards into some reverse mustache. Ladybugs traverse on its limp tongue. The interior of the Porto John emits the impression of some infinite cosmic void. Do you see anything? Margot calls from across the lot. Daiquiri bends down, ignores the bead of sweat trailing down the bridge of his nose to his upper lip. No, he says. Just a body. Don't trust that explanation, Daiquiri. Daiquiri looks into the flowers that occupy the creature's eyes. They are beautiful. A ladybug crawls from the inside of its cheek and nestles on the layer of moss underneath its nose. Its shell is pink, and what Daiquiri has originally perceived to be dots are instead strange stars, as if the dots had bled out its ink. He takes the pistol and uses it to nudge the skull. A plume of rotting vegetable smell almost knocks Daiquiri backwards. He closes his mouth stops his breathing. The flesh is soft. He felt like he was pushing into a cake. The air around him becomes thick, amplified by the muggy humidity. Daiquiri grits his teeth and presses the 22 caliber into the creature's elbow. It offers no resistance, the flesh squishy and receding into an even spongier swollen bone. He swallows a fist of rotting vegetables. Margot comes to check on Daiquiri ten minutes later. He hunches over, one hand on his knee, the other on a sun-heated bench. Orange vomit cascades onto the dirt next to discarded hot dog wrappers and containers of chili. Mint? She holds out a white capsule. He takes one, chews, swallows. You're supposed to suck on them. They're not gum. She says. He pulls out a cigarette and cups the flame away from a warm gust of wind. I took it as a courtesy. Margot looks back. They are 40 feet from the Porta John lot. The Ferris wheel looms to their left, glittering from the sun. How much light do we have left? Daiquiri asks. Couple of hours. Did you call for backup? I needed to do something while you were tasting your breakfast sausages again. Daiquiri inhales, taking long drags to eradicate the sour taste of vomit that cakes on his tongue. Rejoice, repent, revive. The world accepts palms up to the sun, the hands of the moss prophet. Spooky. I'll say. Margot says. Margot shields her eyes from the sun. She faces the collection of porta johns, standing stagnant like old relics. Her shoulder perks upwards, turning away from the looming ferris wheel. Daiquiri wonders if this is conscious or if he is overthinking it. What do you think happened? Daiquiri shrugs. Could be anyone's guess. The moss prophet? She says, turning to him. Either something religious happened here, or sure as hell tried to. Nothing here makes any sense, Daiquiri. Nothing at all. It's bizarre. Gives me the creeps. 
I could use a bourbon right about now. Me too. Let's head back before dark. I don't want to be out here without my flashlight. Decker squashes out the butt of the cigarette with the heel of his boot. And let's stop wasting time. They started their advance once Margot's nerves and Dacry's stomach settled. They skirt the edges of the Porta John Collective and wade in between the stalls once more. Moss has advanced on the sticky picnic benches and little bulbs litter along patches of green like festering zits. The moss on top of the tents inch closer to one another, bridging the empty space. It spears out, ignorant of gravity, like fingers yearning to touch. Their speed slows when they approach the dunk tank, and they skirt the perimeter as if it is a wild animal. The figure remains in stasis, shadowed in the murky algae-infested waters. Strings of kelp now loft from the bottom, trailing from its thighs and forearms, a crema of algae bobs in the sun-beaten wind. The sign, written in a thriving, wriggling ecosystem of moss, now features deep purple orchids and scarlet roses. The moss has become more vibrant, turning the words into bulging, wriggling, blistering masses. Strange ladybugs crawl along the rim of the tank. This is impossible, Daiquiri says. How can the greenery grow so fast here? Margot shakes her head, looking up at the sign, her eyes fixated on Moss Prophet. The only thing that grows this fast is cancer. Daiquiri grunts. He goes to the picnic table to retrieve his jacket, but discovers it is blanketed in its entirety by moss. The furry bristles move like seaweed underneath the river, feeling the air with tiny fingers. A beetle trots along the picnic table, and Daiquiri sees the formation of a miniature ecosystem. Mushrooms sprout from the layer of grass that carpeted the once red and white checkered cover. In vitro bulbs pulse and shine. The beetle roams poking its horn into pustules of glowering bulbs. It is the color of ivory. He wanted to shoot it. Shoot the whole damn jacket. Leave it, Margot says. It's too hot anyway. She has not yet surrendered to total urgency, but Dacry knows she is getting anxious. He is too. On patrols around town, she is more likely to explode in fits of frustration over the smallest things. Too much grease on her fingertips, the light taking too long at an intersection. She is a slow releasing and thus regulating valve of emotional turmoil. Yet throughout, she is known to keep her temper and Dacry knows that he will mentally break before she does. But when she does, Dacry might as well be alone. They joked at the precinct that the two of them are a perfect pair if the objective is to maintain an endurable state of collective frustration throughout the day. It is only a matter of time before one of them would snap. The weeds are getting to them both. They walk along the way they came, turning a corner on the footpath that leads to the sea of towering sunflowers connecting the main entrance of the fair to the rest of it. The stalks stretch to the sun at just above seven feet, forming almost an alleyway. It must have been beautiful, a reminder of summer and celebration. Still, the sunflower heads ignore the carnage and corruption that has swept over the fair like a noxious cloud. Bright yellow leaves sway in the breeze. The stalks interlace and form a wall with the sheer thickness of the clusters. The dirt path looks like a tightrope among a sea of sunshine. They stop at the threshold, looking down the warping path. Daiquiri and Margot hold their pistols with both hands, their palms slippery. Their armpits are damp with sweat and the back of their forearms glisten in the sun from wiping perspiration from their brows. The sun crawls closer to the horizon, just below the pine trees. It disappears behind the ferris wheel. From this distance, and behind the prism of humidity, it seemed to pulse like an idle jellyfish. Daiquiri goes first, looking over his shoulder to make sure Margot's footsteps are real and she is indeed following him. He did not believe in ghosts, but as of today, he knows that he is not sure to believe in anything anymore. They walk along the path of single file, Margot walking backwards to cover their flank. The path dipped at the sides, creating a clear distinction that the dirt to their right and left belongs to sunflowers. It is impossible to see past three, four rows of stalks, and even in the depths of their cluster, they swayed in the wind. Daiquiri focuses ahead of him with a tunnel vision approach. In his periphery, he catches a glimpse of the yellow petals, of the white seeds in the middle. 
he only focuses on the exit. Anything that steps in front, even if it was the specimen reanimated, is subject to shooting. The sunflowers, Margot says. Shut up, Dacry speaks through gritted teeth. Margot's voice croaked, almost a sob. The sunflowers. Almost there, Margot. The sunflowers have teeth. The seeds are teeth. They're salivating. Dacry fights against his curiosity. He is taking short breaths now. His body shakes. Margot moans. Human teeth, Dacry. What has been unleashed here? Margot! Dacry stops, lets her bump into him. He reaches behind him and takes her wrist, half leading, half pulling through the path. He keeps his focus narrow, refusing to look at the ivory teeth that pull at him, refusing to examine the glimpses of torn flannel and wife beaters at the edges of the dirt, tangled in between sunflower stalks. He keeps his focus exclusively on the yellow, the familiar color of sunlight. It anchors him, assures him that whatever lurks at the precipice of his vision has not yet claimed everything. Margot kicks her heels into the dirt path. She twists her wrist to free from Dacry's grasp, but he holds harder. She swears, spits, weeps, even headbutts Dacry's shoulder from behind. She swings the pistol around like an extension of her fist, and Dacry thinks she has forgotten she was holding it. She had cracked. The sunflowers have broken her. They made it to the edge, and Dacry uses the last of his strength to pull her with him as he lunges into the dirt. They tumble atop plastic cups sticky with cola and dropped hot dogs already infested with maggots. Margot's face falls on a candy wrapper, smearing sun-beat chocolate on her cheek, looking like an apostrophe of shit. Her face is red and blotchy, her eyes glassy with tears. Her lower lip balloons to one side, purple and lacerated from her own biting down. She looks at the clouds with a dumb, tired expression. Dacry rolls over onto his buttocks, sitting on some gravel. Patches of dirt scrape along his knees and his chest. He pushes a moss-claimed plastic hot dog canoe away with the nozzle of the 22. The sunflowers loomed behind him, taunting his curiosity. Smiling. Smiling at him with a thousand little molars, dry and chalky from the sun. The two of them wait a bit until Dacry is sure Margot reclaimed her faculties. She looks away from him, and for a second in the coming twilight of the day, she looks almost like a child, ashamed to be afraid of the dark. It's fine, Dacry says, so she did not have to apologize. We made it. Don't tell anyone, okay? They wouldn't believe you about this place anyway. He chews the inside of his cheek. Come on, you need to follow me. Let's stay in the car. No, I need to see the creature. Margot's brows furrow. Her face returns to her normal self. You can't even call it human, Dockery? Is it? It was. Was it? Margot looks away at the setting sun. She says, Why? What solace would it give you? I need to know it's still there. The prospect of the alternative is more frightening, but I can't do it alone. Dockery, come on now. This is stupid. Why? Dockery looks at her. Because I'm afraid, Margot. But I'd rather be afraid and know then be afraid and not know. Margot looks back at the sunflowers, then trailed to the Ferris wheel across the open waters. She seems hardened, but not much more than Dacry. Touching insanity allowed her some immunity to it. She looks at him and gestures with her head to start moving. The marsh glitters and ripples before them. Behind the trees, the Ferris wheel is cast in shadow. Dacry takes Margot's hand and helps her up. Together they walked along the marsh shore, keeping their eyes on the car to ensure that they could really leave and abandon their station. It crosses both of their minds. Waterflies skated across the water, leaving little curves of their wake. Daffodils and lotuses pierced the water in droves, anchoring onto something deep into the ichor. Lily pads gather along the shore like lazy bumper cars. The fairgrounds no longer smell of stale funnel cake and burnt meat. Now a weak, acidic odor of rotting vegetable burps from the marsh. The air turns from beating hot to chilly, and breeze hits their sweat-stained skin with icy kisses. They come upon the creature, but it, like Dacry has predicted, is not quite what it looked like when they left it. The flowers, which sprout from its forearms, thighs, and brows, had spread to its joints. 
Its dislodged jaw is covered with the mossy fur of pulsing algae. The sunflower, fortunately not mutated with teeth, seems to flap in the still air. Layers of moss stuck to the limbs of the creature and adhere it to the marsh. It looked like it was melting. Ladybugs crawl in and out of vacant eye sockets. Some move along the vines that push what remained of its sternum and waist to a length of nine feet. Flower buds blossom underneath cracked fingernails. There, Margot says. Are you happy? Let's get back to the car, Dacry says, thinking of lighting another cigarette to get rid of the smell. The sun is just beyond the crest of the trees now, casting the marsh with a purple and orange glow. Their backup is set to arrive in the next 30 minutes, and of what little words were exchanged between the two, they agreed that it could not pass fast enough. Empty stalls lingered on the grounds, flapping vine-laced tarp. Splotches of shining algae and golf-tossed plastic cups and fold-out chairs. They looked like scabs. Both Daiquiri and Margot keep to themselves, looking out to the marsh and the Ferris wheel beyond. Daiquiri is not sure what Margot feels, but he knows he wants to keep an eye on that creaking wheel. He smokes two cigarettes and leans on the hood of the car, his pistol within arm's reach. Margot sits on the hood, looking up at the orange clouds. Dandelions peek from the pines, like the light of an anglerfish. Green claws wrap disjointed and flower fingers along bark, not to pull the tree down, but to push itself up. A dislodged jawbone swings from the end of a cheekbone. The torso appears from the twilight-shaded trees, clawing at the neighboring branches to gain purchase. The vines stretch and tether along its spinal cord and disappear into the depth of the forest like the marionette strings of a hidden puppeteer. Spots of moss cling to the dried bone like scabs. The skull of the specimen rattles, goes limp, picks itself up again. Margot appears next to Dacry, her twenty-two locked. Dacry assumes his position, keeping his back to hers, glancing around the perimeter of the fair for other intruders. Put your hands up! Margot yells. We'll shoot! The creature ignores her. It digs its fingers into the bark. Miniature petals of yellow and blue fall to the dirt like torn butterfly wings. It puffs out its chest, revealing mossy algae that falls from its ribs like drapes. Daiquiri is not sure what the creature was and refuses to attempt to conceptualize its existence. Last warning! Margot yells. The specimen twitches again. Its jaw hangs limp, tethered by a brittle tendon corroded by algae. Ladybugs trail along its face, its spongy limbs. The leaves rustle the water pressed against the marshy shore. Vibrations sweep, almost like an ambush, from the edges of the woods and the abandoned stalls to their vehicle. The specimen looks on, dumbly, blankly, a sunflower dangling like a broken limb. The vibrations form words. Herein lies the moss prophet. It bounces from the leaves and through the blades of grass, over the stalks of the sunflowers and the canopy of moss that tethers each abandoned tent. It does not come from the specimen, although the vines extending from its spinal cord are now taut and attached to something in the dark ether behind the trees. The ropes vibrate with the words, like the twanging of an instrument. Wherever you are, come out. We have backup arriving any minute. Margot verges on trembling. It's not talking to us. Daiquiri says, goosebumps popping up along his arms. It's talking at us. Accept palms up to the sun and rejoice. The vibrations turn into pulses of sound, pushing his sweat matted hair on end through an invisible wave of static electricity. A low murmur travels along the grounds, moving in and out, in and out, like a heartbeat. The sunflower stands on end, inflated. The specimen adjusts its hold on the trees. Terra incognita. The moss prophet will show the way. Margo, Daiquiri says. His attention shifted from left to right. Each creaking branch and twirl of leaves becomes a threat. He feels the forest watching him. More so, he feels the ferris wheel looming in the distance, now a giant ebony spoke against an orange sky. The electric pulses swirl around them. Energy is focusing here, encroaching from the limits of the fairgrounds, crawling with moss-gloved skeletal hands up the marshy banks. Their vehicle turns into an island. Should I shoot? Margot says. 
Rejoice. Yes, Dacry affirms, afraid to look away. Sounds explode to his left, dispersing the thick cloud of noise that had invaded and violated the air. The petals on the sunflower fall at once, untethered to the skull. The jawbone plummets back in the abyss. Its torso goes limp, held up by the vine-replaced tendons of the forearms. It adjusts itself, headless, clawing the bark for purchase. The vibrations end like the abrupt cease of rain. The echoes fade, morphing into a guttural sound projected at the ends of the specimen's marionette strings. The voice is high-pitched and pluralist. It sounds like the organized effort of a hundred voices speaking in harmonic timber from the precipice of the dark. This is the correct path. The Moss Prophet knows the way. The skeleton loses balance and falls onto the ground. Candy wrappers and cups crinkle under its weight. Beyond the foliage, the vines become slack, taut, and slack again. Daiquiri senses something breathing at the end of those vines. Some primordial force, some beastly evil. It permeates a psychic prodding of dread and powerful eyes staring at him from the darkness. It is not angry eyes. He was being judged. Daiquiri starts to make his way across the grounds. No. Margot said. Hell no. Margot, we need to see it. Not with two 22s we don't. She stares at Daiquiri. Her brow creases. I feel it too. That force. Whatever it is. I'm not talking about the surround sound vibrations. Something beyond the trees. Yes, you're being stupid. She pulls at his wrist. I need to find out, Daiquiri says. That's why we were called here. We were not called to die. This is bigger than us. Daiquiri unlatches himself. The skeleton emitted a sour smell even from this distance. It is both the scent of rotting vegetables and of decaying flesh. The vines look like umbilical cords. Whatever force that once stares at them and speaks from the undersides of the foliage is no longer there. Daiquiri is certain that it no longer watches them because of how intense its absence. He needs to find out, to venture across the crumbling skeleton, to step along the dead leaves and wade through the steady heartbeats of the chirping crickets. He needs to know something, anything about the Moss Prophet. He needs to stand where the Force is, to know that it is true, that it is not some cosmic entity or god. Because what if it is? He stops at the click of the 22's safety. Daiquiri looks over his shoulder and down the barrel of Margot's gun. Her hands tremble, eyes red. If you take another step forward, I will kill you. Margo. Daiquiri resists a smile. The situation is so surreal, it is sobering. What are you doing? Do you want to become one of those creatures? Do you want to let whatever monster take you so the next agents come by can find you popping out of a port -john? Do you want to be the creature that you were keen on investigating in the first place? Do you want to be a fucking sunflower? Daiquiri bites his lip. He looks over to the darkness, to the crumbling skeleton. Crickets chirp and green head flies skate along the marsh. The ferris wheel looms, watching them as if with some great eye. A wind carries along the water, bringing with it the smell of the marsh and mud, sweeping the rotting carcass stench back into the forest. He stares back at Margot, at the darkness of the pistol. He shakes his head, swears under his breath, and brushes past her, fumbling for a cigarette as he makes his way back to the car. He opens the door and rolls down the window, staring at Margot as she returns the pistol to its holster, breathing with relief. Smoke trails from Daiquiri's fingers. The pyre leans, almost limp, over the open window. They stared at one another from across the grounds, separated by the windshield. He gestures for Margot to join him in the car. She chewed on the inside of her lip and walked along. At once, a thrush of vines whip like tentacles from the darkness, like Kalalu, like the Kraken. A great and evil force wraps pensile and thorny vines around Margot, constricting her like a boa. Gunshot sounds as ribs crack, the movement so swift that she does not cry out, only her eyes realizing that she is being lifted off the ground and turned into mush. A vine slithers over her neck twists, pulls, and Margot goes limp, crucified against the bark of a gnarled tree, a marionette just like this specimen.
Daiquiri pulls his pistol out of its holster, ready to get out of the car. The forest vibrates again. Follow, follow. The vines tear Margot to pieces, her limbs separating in fireworks of blood and bone. Her body, now fragments of meat, disappears into the darkness of the trees, into the gurgling mess of the moss prophet's abode. Daiquiri closes the door, his hands shaking as the marsh creeps to the vehicle. A green silhouette of something humanoid, but not human, is visible behind a thicket of intertwined branches. Something with one yellow and one purple eye. Not Margot. A bit of an ash from the cigarette falls onto his shirt, snapping him to attention. He starts the car, reverses, speeds through the muddy marsh that looks different from when he came. He travels alone, underneath the banner for the town fair which is not crusted with splotches of moss. Parked cars look aged through desolation, furry with writhing lichen and dotted with speckles of yellow and red flowers in full bloom. Already bodies have begun their transformation into the botanical collective. Eyes rattle, listless, a content primordial bliss. Tears sting Daiquiri's eyes, but he does not wipe them away. His cigarette cradles between his lips, his tongue occasionally lapping against the papery, acrid butt, hardly puffing. He drives onward through the town, aiming to get back to the precinct and warn the others that something, someone, is coming. Evacuate the town. Evacuate the county. Evacuate Florida. The other end of the road, right before town, there is a cavalcade of large tank-like vehicles. Men in jumpsuits and gas masks peek out of the backs of these iron hulks, looking around at the marsh, the muggy sky. Sunshine reflects sabers of light from their ruby goggles like they are blinking at Daiquiri. Police tape has cordoned off the road. Daiquiri stops at their command. Someone with a flamethrower and a gas tank strapped to their back comes over. He asks for Daiquiri's ID, and Daiquiri shows him his badge. This relaxes the guard a bit. What is going on here? Daiquiri asks. Some sort of virus, the man says, his breathing electronic and labored by the mask. Still looking for patient zero. Daiquiri nods, without a second thought, drives past the checkpoints, smashes through the police tape and wooden barriers, and burns tires past all the sanitation vehicles that have been set up like little carnival games. There is a crowd of people standing on the sides of the road, dressed in robes, shouting, Moss Prophet cometh, Moss Prophet cometh, palms up and rejoice. And Daiquiri drives, thinking of the specimen, thinking of the sunflowers and the Ferris wheel and the dunk tank. He pulls over on the side of the road, lightheaded and hot, and begins to weep for Margot's last moments of life. Twenty minutes later, he reaches into his pocket for another cigarette. His wrist turns upward as he flicks the lighter, notices a little dandelion sprouted from his forearm. I still get flashes before I open my eyes in the morning. We went ice skating. Hannah was laughing one minute, then the next, she was gone. The only sign of her whereabouts was a dark and foreboding jagged hole in the ice. My wife Marjorie fell to her knees over top of it, plunging her arms shoulder deep into the freezing water that rapidly ran beneath the fracturing layers of ice. Her arms dipped downwards repeatedly each time coming up holding nothing but air. Porter, she screamed. See if you can get a glimpse of her under the ice. One more second and she'll die down there. Help, please. Someone help us. That was the last time us or anyone else ever saw our sweet girl again. Her body was never recovered. Not due to lack of trying, mind you. For the next five days after, damn near every fireman, EMT, police officer, and concerned citizen was on the borders of that ice, helping look as much as they could without causing the ice across the entire pond to cave in, resulting in an undoubtedly more tragedy. Still, despite all that effort, my wife and I still honored an empty, child-sized casket at her funeral. Frozen waters can be deceiving. It's like an optical illusion. 
you never realize how fast the water underneath is traveling due to the stillness of the ice. With all of the trauma we had been through, I thought it best to relocate. I wanted to move Marjorie and myself away from anything that had to do with our daughter. The agony of her death haunted us like a ghost. Her teachers would be at the grocery stores, their sympathetic eyes glazing over with tears as they regaled us with tales of how intelligent and sweet our dead daughter was. We didn't want to forget her. It was the opposite of that, actually. We wanted to be able to get to a place where we could remember her with love, without the tidal wave of suicidal sadness and grief. We ended up moving two towns over after looking at dozens of houses. It was ultimately me who ended up making the decision. Marjorie was paraded through home after home with blank, soulless eyes. I ashamedly stopped bringing her after touring our 14th rental property. The realty agent made a comment about how spacious the residence was, with two other bedrooms accompanying the master. My wife looked at him with tear-glazed eyes and muttered, I don't care how many rooms it has, I just want to be with my daughter. I was admittedly about ready to give up when I came upon a ranch-style house with barn red shutters. Something about it seemed so welcoming, even from the outside. I flirted with the idea for over two weeks. It was the only residence that I'd come back to in order to make multiple tours of. I was more than ecstatic when I found out it was barely a breath's ear over our allotted budget. By the time all was said and done, the realty agent knew me by name and could recognize the vehicle I drove. It took mere moments to sign the paperwork, and before I knew it, I was on my way back to Marjorie to pack up for our new home. I guided her gingerly through each room, doing my best to hide my excitement. It's not that I was happy that we had to move. Our daughter would grace my every thought and decision until the day that I die, but I wanted this house to represent more than her death. If that was all it was going to amount to, we might as well have stayed at the old house. That house? Those empty spaces were full of a luxury that I thought people like us were too old to be afforded. Potential. The potential of a new life in a new place was the last straw of happiness that I had to grasp at. And God forgive me, I intended to hold on with both hands. My footsteps stopped short in the hallway, causing Marjorie's body to crash into me before bouncing away. Jesus, Porter? She winced as she rubbed the shoulder that had taken the brunt of impact. I, I'm sorry, honey, I muttered. It's just that. My voice trailed off uselessly, unsure of exactly what to say. The hallway was interrupted by a large wooden door on the left-hand side, one that I didn't remember seeing the previous times I'd explored the house. The orange paint that consumed it, although faded, screamed against the cream-colored walls the door was surrounded by. Marjorie's voice quickly grabbed me back from the brink of my confusion. What's behind this one? Another bedroom, do you think? You told me it only had two. You know, I'm not really sure, I admitted. I don't remember this being here before. My fingers traced the grooves in the masonite panels that were decoratively adorned in the middle before placing my hand on the doorknob. My wrist twisted and turned to no avail. The door was locked proper. I was pretty sure the realtor hadn't mentioned anything about extra keys either. I raced to the kitchen mid-thought, leaving a very confused Marjorie unattended in the empty hallway. The kitchen and cupboard drawers yielded no results as far as keys went, and I was pretty sure the key to the front door was meant solely for that entrance. Nevertheless, I still tried. My wife, who lately hadn't been able to muster up much emotion for anything, suddenly became enraptured with this door and the possibilities it could reveal. She had broken two credit cards in half trying to unlock the door, a technique she would use as a teenager when her drunken mother forgot to leave the house unlocked for her after work. In no time flat, she was rushing past me to the kitchen, rummaging through the same exact drawers that I had mere moments earlier before emerging with a butcher's knife. She peered into the sliver of space between the dead latch and strike of the doorknob before gently inserting the blade of the knife between them. What the hell are you doing, Marge? You're going to chip the paint. I exclaimed in spite of myself. I always had the worst timing and this incident was further proof of that. Fuck the paint, she muttered. Her face scrunched in exaggerated concentration. Whoa, you are bringing nighttime aggression to a daytime conversation. 
I joked. Her facial expression didn't change and my heart sagged. That used to be one of her favorites. Ugh, Porter. She began to scold me, bringing her gaze up to meet mine instead of remaining focused on where it needed to be. The handle of the knife slipped as a result, peppering the door with dots of crimson as it slashed through the soft flesh on the palm of her hand. God damn it! She shouted. The knife clattered to the floor at her feet and she placed her injured hand against the door reflexively to steady herself. A pert series of clicks reverberated throughout the hallway and my eyes widened in astonishment. Marjorie's trembling hand, still dripping with blood, reached down and gripped the brass doorknob. It turned effortlessly as she pulled it open, her facial features freezing in abject horror. Hannah? She called out, struggling to maintain proper balance as she began removing her shoes one at a time. I'm right here. Mommy's coming, baby. I reached out and grabbed her by the elbow just as she leapt for the doorway. I had come around the other side of the open door and was finally able to see what she was seeing. My breath caught in my throat, unable to travel any further until my mind processed the sight before me. The room wasn't really a room at all. The space behind this door could easily have been as large as the entire house by itself. It was a vast, deep blue body of water and our daughter floated happily in the middle of it while looking out at us expectantly. I stuck my hand inside, expecting to feel the ebb and flow of water. Instead, I became entangled in a pliant substance that acted almost as sort of a barrier to contain what was inside, separating worlds. My wife had decided to take a different approach, jerking her elbow out of my grasp and jumping inside. I of course followed, straining through the thick outer membrane as it fought to keep me out like how the body reacts to a foreign object. Freezing cold water consumed my every sense as I fought not the urge to scream. Bubbles emerged from my wife's lips as she held our daughter to her sobbing chest. Hannah reached up and placed a hand over her mother's mouth before shaking her head back and forth in warning. The words, don't try to breathe, floated through the burbled hydroponics of our atmosphere. My nasal passages began to ache with yearning, as if on cue and my eyes burned terribly. I hitched an arm under my little girl and began to swim for the doorway, intending to use as much force as the aquatics allowed me to push her through to the other side. She stopped just before the entrance, marveling in silence at the bright hallway on the other side. Her tiny hand reached back for her mother's while sadness shaded her features. At the last moment, she placed her small arms in the back of our necks and shoved us through the doorway with an effort she would have never been capable of in life. An inhuman noise of despair rose from my wife's chest before emanating into the air around us as she tumbled to the cold tile floor of our hallway. The door slammed shut, unwilling to open again to my touch. As much as I loved my child, I had no desire to go into that room again. Our lives had taken on a dark and sinister feeling ever since we had discovered it. Marjorie had maxed out our credit cards loading up on oxygen tanks and various scuba equipment, making our house heavily combustible now among other things. I had come home to find trails of waterlogged footprints leading in different locations throughout the house, knowing there was only one place they could have come from. Instead of being happy like I assumed she would be, I found my wife becoming darker and more withdrawn. Her every waking thought possessed by our daughter and opening that door. She rushed through meals and began to neglect the most basic tasks of self-care. Every moment spent in our realm, our reality had become a waste of her time. A performance for her to go through the motions of until she could return to her newfound aquatic hell. We would argue terribly and more and more often. The dissolution of our marriage was becoming a tangible entity. I sank into my own hell of drugs and alcohol in an effort to understand a truly incomprehensible situation. They never found her body, Porter. The words exploded through my wife's mouth with an iron conviction. It's because she came here. She was waiting for us, honey. You told me yourself. You said the moment you stepped inside this house, you had an overwhelmingly good feeling that it was supposed to be our home. As long as we aren't breathing, we can be a family again. Tears flooded my eyes, along with a maelstrom of feelings. There was an overwhelming sadness mixed with the crippling fear that my wife's mental state was now broken beyond repair. 
I wasn't equipped to deal with this. Damn it, I needed her. Hannah was my daughter too. Had my eyes for Christ's sake. I longed for the luxury of madness just like Marjorie had helped herself to. In my wife's mind, they were very much together and our daughter had not been lost. It's been four days since Marjorie last entered the room to the left of the hallway. That means it's been over 96 hours since she took her last breath. No oxygen tank in the world could withstand that amount of time, not to mention the devastation to her skin and organs. Her words echoed through my mind, becoming more waterlogged and unintelligible as the hours and days passed. As long as we aren't breathing, we can be a family again. The past month's worth of events have been akin to living in a drug-like state. I had become adjusted to a reality that didn't belong to me, didn't even belong to this world. As beautiful and intoxicating as it was for my wife, it was high time for us to wake up. Whatever mirage that room contained was not our little Hannah. I knew in my heart that it couldn't be. Our little girl would have passed away to enter heaven with the angels, not to be stuck in a water-filled bit of limboed existence. No one deserved that, especially not the innocent soul of a child. Marjorie would grow to accept that, hopefully even agree with it in time. This was never the way things were supposed to be. I pressed my palm against the door, praying it would open for me like it always had for Marjorie. The tumbler cylinder inside of the doorknob clicked, sending a series of echoes through our seemingly empty home. I grasped the knob, turning it tentatively and pulling outward with a shaky hand. My lungs grabbed every spare centimeter of air it allowed as I thrust myself through the elastic membrane. White noise consumed the inside of my entire body, turning my blood and bones to static electricity as I was plunged into the icy cold abyss that had now become my daughter's forever home. It took me a moment to see them, but I started running the second that I did, fighting buoyancy with every step. Their still, peaceful forms lay cuddled up on their sides in a four-poster canopied bed. The sheets that shrouded their resting bodies billowed in tandem with the flow of the water that had stolen my family. My lungs began to twitch with impatience as I slipped an arm under Marjorie, careful not to disturb the entity impersonating my dead daughter. Her hair floated like an auburn halo around her face as I lifted her from the mattress. We had almost cleared the bed completely when her left foot became unexpectedly entangled in the pale pink canopy drapes. This small interruption was just enough to gather Hannah's very unwanted attention. She looked at me confusedly through amber-colored eyes and held her hands up, as if wordlessly asking where her mommy was going. I ignored her with a breaking heart, averting my eyes to the doorway. It was becoming harder and harder to hold my breath. My senses were becoming warped and fuzzy as my chest began to radiate with a white-hot heat. Hannah drifted towards us, her arms outstretched in a desperate longing. As we neared the door, I noticed Hannah's face began to change. Her once rounded features were now pointed and angular, giving her face a malevolence that she could never possibly possess. Her eyes were two deep black pits of rage, and her jagged teeth gnashed together in a snarl as she attempted to rip at Marjorie's clothes and flesh. Her small mouth opened wide, her jaw unhinging and emitting a roar that rippled torrents of motion through the water, whipping items wildly around the room. Once I was confident that I had closed enough distance between me and our way out, I swirled around, positioning myself feet first towards the door. My lower body racked with convulsions as I found myself stuck between worlds. My bottom half had made it out successfully, while my top refused to let go of the only thing I had left, my wife. I pulled with everything that I had to get her through the other side to no avail. What's worse, the outer edges of the doorway had begun to shrink, making my exit to the mortal more difficult with each passing second. My muscles quaked, shuddering in agony as my strength began to wane. I had mere moments left to get her through this doorway and my body was failing fast. Most of the entrance had soon solidified, leaving a space only large enough for my hands to hold onto hers. The rest of my body had been spat through to the other side, but by the grace of all that was holy, I had managed to keep hold of her hands. A final jolt racked my body as I felt her arms be ripped away from mine, our hands disconnecting for the last time in this lifetime. 
Sweat mingled with the fresh water and tears that had coated my face, stinging my already injured eyes as sobs wrenched through my body. By the time I rose to my feet, the entire doorway was gone, as if never existing to begin with. Only a thick layer of wood and insulation covered by painted blue drywall remained. I know this because, much to my renter's horror, I hammered through it myself to be sure. My mind feels broken, rendered useless by a constant state of fear. I'm afraid of living a life alone without my family, afraid when I think of the state my wife and daughter are currently in, lost to the ether of an unknown world I couldn't touch. But mostly, I was afraid of what they'd be like if I ever got them back. The only thing that can keep me upright through all of this, the only thing that can give me any form of humanly comfort, is that out of everything, at least Marjorie got her wish. Her mind again sounds through my brain, her words holding crystal clarity. Porter, I just want to be with my daughter. They've called me a shit magnet since I was a kid. It's only an expression, sure, but I think it might also be a real thing. If a smile can attract smiles, sure as a corpse can attract flies, there's no reason a guy like me can't attract trouble, just by virtue of being me. When they first called me a shit magnet so long ago, I guess I felt a little insulted. In retrospect, though, I really don't see it as an insult. I think what they were trying to say was, it's not really my fault. That's what I thought the night I heard the shots. Woke me up out of a dead sleep. In my dreams, we were kids again, setting off those pirate crackers and the 50-gallon drums at the construction site. Blam, blam, blam. But before I knew it, my eyes were wide open, and I'd been transported back to the motel room and the shots kept coming. Blam, blam, blam. And there was a shout, a scream more like it, and then a car door slamming and tires spinning in the gravel, then a big block engine warbling off into the distance, and then there was nothing. I lay in the lumpy motel bed with my eyes wide open. I didn't know what time it was. I hadn't even brought a watch along with me. I was on my way to pick up an old Mustang some guy had for sale just like the one I used to drive as a kid. I only stopped in this remote shit town to spend the night. I was the one and only person in this dingy-ass motel. Even the guy manning the office had gone home. It was only me and whatever was going on out there. I lay there for a while, trying to process what I may or may not have heard. Finally, I sat up. Nah, those were no pirate crackers. I got out of bed and walked to the door, pulled the shade aside and looked out the window. It was pouring rain. Not much to see. I opened the door and looked across the parking lot. Fat raindrops smacked into the puddles like little explosions. Not one car in the parking lot besides mine. Could I have dreamed the whole thing up? <laughs> nah, no way. I pulled my windbreaker on and walked outside. No sound but the rain. I walked about halfway across the parking lot before I saw it, a nondescript black sedan parked in the roadside opposite the motel. A barrage of raindrops sent steaming off the hood. I crossed the parking lot, then stood at the side of the pavement and looked up and down the road. Dead quiet. No one around. Probably not for miles. I went across the street and approached the black sedan. I walked around the car, looked in the windows. No one inside there was a duffel bag in the back seat. Around back, I saw one tire flat, a twist of steam coming off the end of the tailpipe. There were holes in the rear fender, clean little holes, and I knew it hadn't been firecrackers that made all that noise. My heart sped up a bit. I looked up and down the road again, but it was still just me. Just me, the car, and the rain. Or was it? Hello? I waited for a minute but there was no reply. There was a little clearing out beyond the brush on the side of the road. I forded the few bushes there and looked out into the weeds. It didn't take long before I saw what I was looking for. 
I walked over the crumpled heap in the clearing and nudged it with my foot. Hey. No response. I kneeled down and had a closer look. The man appeared Mexican or something like it. His eyes were half open, but there was no life in them. I turned him onto his back and saw the blossom of blood on his white undershirt. The guy had been shot. More than once by the look of it. Now, why'd they do that, buddy? I squatted there in the rain for a minute, just kind of acclimating myself to the situation. I looked back at the road. Still, no one had driven by. Then back at the man. I started patting down his clothes. In his front pocket, I found a wallet. Inside the wallet was $45. I folded the money and put it in my pocket. I thought of checking his ID, but I didn't suppose it made any difference who he was. I put the wallet on his chest. In his jacket, I found a small revolver, a 38 caliber with a snub-nosed barrel. It looked to have been hit by a bullet itself, maybe one of the bullets that killed him. I didn't know if it would fire right, so I left it where I'd found it. I stood up and turned back to the road. A gale of wind sent the rain sideways. I walked back to the car and looked up and down the road to make sure no one was coming. I opened the side door and slid in next to the canvas bag. The car smelled strongly of marijuana. I unzipped the bag and looked inside. There were two rifles, Bushmaster AR-15s. Looked brand new, worth at least seven, eight hundred apiece, almost half of what I meant to spend on that Mustang. Guess that's a bad idea, I said. Maybe I was talking to myself, maybe I was talking to my other self. But it was my other self who answered. Guess it's my lucky night, I said. Maybe I was right on both counts. In the end, I was walking back out into the rain with the duffel bag under my arm. I walked back to my car in the motel parking lot and unlocked the trunk and set the duffel bag inside. I covered it with some old clothes and towels and closed the lid. The rain was coming down harder now. I hurried back to my room and toweled off in the little bathroom. As soon as I had, though, something occurred to me. Well, shit. I went back out into the rain. I loped across the parking lot and back to the car. I reached under the dash and felt around for the trunk lever. I pulled it, watching the lid through the rear window. I went around back and opened it. Five more duffel bags, plastic carry cases, cases of ammo. The trunk was packed with guns. For a minute, all I could do was stand there looking at it. That weird feeling like you stepped in a puddle maybe a little deeper than you thought it was. But by then, you were already in it, weren't you? Even if the water was seeping in over the tops of your shoes. In for a penny? I said to myself. I slung the duffels over my shoulder and stacked the five pistol cases on the lip of the trunk and fumbled the lid closed. I carried them back to my car and set the bags inside the trunk with the others. Then I arranged the pistol cases inside so they wouldn't shift around too much. My body was all full of adrenaline, same as it was when I went all in on a poker hand or bet my ass on a horse. I was about to close the lid and get ready to go, but my curiosity got the better of me. I flipped the latches on one of the heavier cases and peeked inside. Well, goddamn. I closed the case, took it and another two cases back into the room with me. I set them on the bed and opened them and just sat there enjoying the adrenaline thumping through my heart. I chuckled to myself then reached in and lifted out the gold-plated Desert Eagle. I weighed it in my hand, ejected the magazine, popped it back in. I gripped it and looked down the sights. I pulled back the slide and looked down the barrel. Almost wide enough to fuck. There it was on the slide. 0 .50 AE. And how much does this thing bring in at the five and dime? There were five of them. Two gold, three nickel, all in 50 caliber. 2,000 for the gold plated, a little less for the nickel. No telling where they had been lifted from, but come inventory time, someone was going to have a heart attack. Maybe a 50 caliber embolism. I packed the guns and the rest of my stuff in the car and dropped the key in the return box. I started the car and pulled out of the parking lot, my headlights panning the crime scene from right to left. I was about to take off, but I stopped there a moment. In for a pound, I said. I pulled in next to the shot-up car and parked, checked the rearview mirror, pulled the trunk lever, 
I got out and opened the trunks of both cars. I lifted cases of 5.56 and 50 caliber ammunition from the trunk of the sedan and switched them to mine. When I was done, I could swear the ass of the old Toyota was hanging an inch lower. I closed both trunks and got back behind the wheel, wiped the rain from my eyes, and checked the mirrors again. There was no one out here but me and Chico. Not a single passerby since the whole thing went down. In any case, though, I was done pushing my luck. The radio said it was 3 a.m., felt about right, and I drove down the road with around $15,000 worth of guns and ammo in the trunk, the moon following me through the leafless trees like a knowing watchful eye. Would I have done anything different if the motel man asked for ID or if I'd paid with a card or left any other evidence of my presence behind? Probably not. It was just luck that I hadn't. I finished the night behind an abandoned gas station in the corner of town. When I opened my eyes, the whole thing felt just like another of my crazy dreams. But this was no dream. Everyone gets a lucky night once in a while, even a guy like me. I got out of the car, stretched, checked my surroundings. The morning sun burning off the last of the rain, the perfumed country air. I felt like the last man on earth. I reached in and popped the trunk. There in the light of the morning were the damp canvas bags, pistol cases, and ammo. I flipped the latches on a case and looked in at the gold-plated eagle. I'd keep this one, I decided. The rest I'd sell off, but this one was mine. I opened one of the ammo cases and took out a box of 50s. I slid out a magazine and started thumbing in the obscenely big cartridges. It might have fit seven, but I got in five and decided to leave it at that. I slid the mag back in, gripped it, sighted down the barrel, held it at my side, felt the weight in my hand. I looked out into the wooded area behind the station. Damn, did I want to shoot it. The very idea made my senses tingle, but I had better sense than that. I brought the gun up front with me, set it lovingly on the passenger seat. I looked at it a last time and pulled away. The radio said it was 9 a.m., I stopped at a diner on the way out of town and ordered a big breakfast. I sat there eating eggs and bacon and thinking about money. Thought about what I'd do with all of it once I got my hands on it. Maybe hit the track. Maybe an all-nighter at the blackjack table. Hell, I might even win this time. It sure felt like I was starting a lucky streak. And if I didn't, it was free money to begin with. All this, of course, was predicated on finding some troublemaker willing to pick up what I was putting down maybe some shit magnet himself. I paid for breakfast with one of Chico's 20s and let the waitress keep the change. Thanks, Chico. I pulled into the long gravel driveway at 2 p.m. I saw the Mustang sitting in the driveway, looking just like it did in the pictures. An old 5.0, 4.10 gears, upgraded wheels. Old Stanley had decided to drive something more practical, he explained. Most people got practical as they got older, the word itself was a common refrain among guys my age, but I didn't like it. The way I see things, there's nothing graceful about aging gracefully. A barking dog announced my arrival and Stanley came out on the porch. I put the Desert Eagle in the glove box and flipped it shut. I parked the car and got out to meet him. We shook hands. Thanks for coming out all this way. So, here's your toy order, eh? Just got a few things in it I have to move, then it's all yours. You gonna junk it? Fix it up? I'm undecided, he said. Might could spruce her up a bit. Got no parts for her, but I could patch the rust and maybe paint it. These Toyotas run forever. Real practical vehicles. We'll see. I nodded. I didn't care what he did with it, as long as the plates were off of it and it was no longer traceable to me. I'd take the long way out of town with my new acquisitions and drive the speed limit all the way back home. No doubt they had found Chico by now, but there was nothing linking any of that to me. All I was guilty of was a little finder's keepers. I made sure my car was locked up and we took the Mustang for a spin. Pleased, I pulled in next to my old Toyota and parked. The agreed upon price was 3 k and the Toyota. It was a fair and reasonable price and I was ready to pay it. But first I studied the guy's face. 
Maybe Stanley would be interested in an alternative form of payment. So what are you thinking? Like the car? I do. I was just wondering if maybe you'd be interested in something other than cash. Other than cash? An odd look came over his face. If there was a tactful way to suggest what I had in mind, I couldn't decide what it was. I figured I might as well just come out with it. Got some brand new Bushmaster ARs, worth maybe $800 apiece. I'd take $500 if you're interested. He lifted a hand. Nah, no can do, he said. I need the cash. I cleared my throat. How about $350? That's the absolute lowest I can... Cash only. Sorry if you had any ideas willing to trade it out, but I'm not. The best I could do was knock off $500 for the toy order, but that's it. You still want it? I pretended to reconsider for a moment, but I went ahead and shook his hand. If I had ever intended to back out of the deal, that option went out the window the minute I found those guns. There was no way I was driving out of here in the same car I arrived in. The money changed hands and that was that. Or it should have been anyway, but Stanley wasn't too keen on social cues. He seemed intent on standing right there with me until the moment I left. Probably meant to wave bye-bye and everything. Which meant there was no way to discreetly move the arsenal from the Toyota to the Mustang. Discreet was plan A. Plan B would have to be nonchalance. So I went ahead and popped the trunk. Yeah, I'll tell you. When it rains around here, it sure does rain. I know we need it, but... With the pause in his sentence... I knew old Stanley had spotted the contents of my trunk. Yeah, sure, we need it, I said. He gestured toward the trunk. You a gun dealer or something, mister? Yes, sir. Hope I didn't alarm you. He was still looking in the trunk. No, no. Headed to a show or something? That's right. Where at? We made eye contact. Bethesda, I said. It was the first place that came to my mind. A gun show in Bethesda? I nodded. Figure I'll get there by tonight, check out the town and the shows on Saturday. What's it called? He asked. We met eyes again. Bethesda gun show, I said. That must have satisfied him because he appeared to relax. He went on pelting me with platitudes while I transferred the guns and ammo to the Mustang's trunk. When I was all loaded up, I closed the lid and returned to the glove box to retrieve my eagle. I stuck the gun under my waistband. It threatened to pull my pants down, but it was more appropriate than brandishing it. I thanked Stanley for the car and bid him good day. I backed out of the driveway and onto the main road, enjoying the throaty rumble of the engine. It was going to be a long ride back home. God knows it'd go a whole lot faster without the contraband in the trunk. I pulled into a gas station about 20 miles east. I got out of the car and stood back to admire my new ride. I'd had one just like it when I was a kid. A 19-year-old shit magnet with similar sensibilities. Crashed the thing into a dumpster one night. Totaled the car but walked away without a scratch. I don't remember how I got home. Don't even remember what happened to the car. All I know is that was the last time I drove one. Until now. Second chances. Everyone deserves one. I went into the store to pay with cash. The man at the register regarded me suspiciously, like most people seem to do. Must be something in my eyes, I guess. Can I help you? Twenty bucks on pump one, I said. The man took my twenty and rang me up. I looked down at the bulge in my pants, still toting the giant pistol like some obscene erection. Had to be the worst carry weapon I had ever worn especially without a holster. But obscene is just how it felt, and it felt so good. That other part of me, the one I talked to sometimes, he wanted to pull it out and point it at the guy. I knew if I did, he'd be seeing the thing in his dreams. Go ahead, I said to myself. I could feel my heart rate increasing, same way it did when I was out looking for coke or shopping for hookers. I glanced up at the corners of the shop, but there were no cameras, just those anti-theft mirrors. I wondered how much cash was in the register. I looked at the cashier, 
pictured his buggy eyes bugging out even further while he stared down the half-inch wide barrel. I could even kill him if I wanted to. I was pretty close to entertaining that little voice in my head when the blue and red lights started flashing in the security mirrors. I looked out into the parking lot. A trooper had parked right behind my Mustang, and while I watched, another cop car pulled right in front of it. Furious, I looked at the cashier, but he seemed just as confused as I was. There were four cops. Three of them stayed back, circled the Mustang, peeked in the windows. The fourth was approaching the store. Stanley, good old Stanley, took my money and called the goddamn cops. Probably reported the Mustang stolen. Told him I'd robbed him at gunpoint. I can't say I knew exactly what I was supposed to do at that moment, but in all my confusion, a few things were pretty clear. The cops knew about the guns in my trunk, and I wasn't going to be able to explain that away. Not only were the guns themselves enough to fuck me, but I'd inevitably be linked to the whole murder thing that happened to Chico out by the motel. And my brand new gold-plated Desert Eagle was as good as gone, without even the chance to shoot it. Somehow that seemed the most tragic part of all. One way or another, that gun was coming out of my waistband. Only question was, would it be the cops taking it out, or would it be me? Are you in some kind of trouble, mister? The cashier asked. I looked at the guy, this boring good boy cashier working at his local gas station for minimum wage. Probably never rocked the boat in his life. Probably never had any excitement. Maybe never had any fun at all. I was born in trouble, I said. I pulled the Desert Eagle out of my waistband and racked around. I leveled it at the approaching police officer. A flood of adrenaline coursed through my body, making my ears ring and my head swim. That's a bad idea, buddy. I glanced at the cashier. Funny thing, I couldn't tell if he had said that to me or I had said it to myself. As usual, though, it was my other self who answered, not with words, but a pull of the trigger. The blast was such that I nearly lost hold of the gun, but I didn't. On top of that, the ensuing slug might have been the luckiest shot of my life. The concussion liked to have disintegrated the window before the bullet even got there, beyond which the policeman's head just plain disappeared. One moment it was there, the next it simply wasn't. And he was still walking, two or three steps, almost like he didn't realize his head was missing. Then he dropped, out by the pumps, sheer pandemonium. But I heard nothing. The cashier was gone. I aimed at the trooper's car and fired three shots. Two went wild, but one hit the car behind the staying and blew out all four windows. I ducked behind a magazine rack and waited. It was quiet for a minute, but then a barrel peeked over the hood and returned fire. Something punched into my shoulder, but I was pretty sure it was just the magazine rack getting hit. I waited for a break in the shots, then slid out behind the rack and fired toward the hood. I don't know if I hit him or not. I advanced, ducked behind a closer shelf. Shots came, careened off the bricks, shattered glass drink coolers in back of the store. I waited, popped up, leveled the gun, and pulled the trigger. Nothing happened. The slide was locked back. Empty already. Now I know what you're thinking. I'd loaded the thing myself. I should have been well aware there were only five shots in it. But the truth is, I've never paid much attention to anything. Not when I was a kid playing with firecrackers, not when I was a teenager driving drunk, and certainly not now doing whatever the hell I was doing. Whatever I do, I just do it. And whatever happens, that's just what happens. When it all comes down to it, I don't have much of a say in anything. It happens to me. I haven't made a conscious choice my whole goddamn life. My lucky day, I said. That's when the shot hit me. Felt like a car crashing into my back. The desert eagle flew out of my hand as I hit the floor. My last conscious thought lamenting the beautiful gold finish as it skittered across the tiles. I had taken a load of birdshot to the back, compliments of the friendly cashier, and a 38 to the shoulder by one of my cop friends. The surgeon plucked out every last one, though, and was told I would make a full recovery. 
My guns, of course, were gone, and so was my Mustang, but at least I had held on to my life. I did a pretty bang-up job defending myself in court, I thought, even if the judge and jury didn't see things my way. Maybe after I get out of prison, I can become a defense lawyer or something. Of course, I'm never supposed to get out of here, but no one knows better than me. An object in motion tends to stay in motion. And a shit magnet is always in motion because even though I'm locked up, I know the shit is still coming my way. And when it does, I know something is going to happen. I'll tell you the first thing I plan to do when I get out, though. First thing I'm going to do is find another Mustang, an even better one than the one I bought off that rat Stanley. Maybe I'll even get one of those new style ones. I don't know how I'm going to get it, but I'm sure I'll come up with something when the time comes. And by that time, I'm pretty sure I'll know what I'm going to do next. I've always lived like that, one step at a time. In fact, if you asked me my secret to living a good life, that's probably the advice I'd give you. Just put one foot ahead of the other. One foot in front of the other and eventually you'll get to where you're going. Whatever happens along the way, well, you can hardly be responsible for that. Bertram couldn't be sure how long Emmeline had been dead. She had been in the bathroom taking one of her late afternoon soaks. He hadn't heard a peep out of her since she had turned off the faucets over an hour ago. He didn't think much about it. After all, they were both in their early 70s, and as you got older, things naturally took longer. Bertram was kicked back in his time-worn recliner watching baseball. It was now well into the fourth inning when the thought hit him to check on her. Lord, what if she's fallen and knocked herself unconscious? He had sat through enough of those medical alert commercials to know that it was relatively easy to end up on the kitchen floor or, and this was when the disturbing mental picture took hold of him, a bathtub full of water. He got up, walked to the bathroom, and banged on the door. You okay in there? She didn't answer, so he opened the unlocked door and stepped inside. Emmeline was sitting in the tub, her head tilted to the side. She appeared to be napping. Emmeline? Emmeline, honey? He inched closer to the tub. The knot in his stomach grew tighter as he reached out and pushed her shoulder. She slumped down to the water line. He jumped back as if the tub had sent an electrical shock through him. Bertram's quaking hand felt her neck for a pulse, but found none. He stared at her chest for any movement. It was still. Oh, lordy lord, Emmeline? Oh, Jesus, no. He backed out of the bathroom until he bumped into the wall in the hallway. He turned and staggered to the living room and dropped down onto the recliner. Bertram was shaky and confused. Once he collected and arranged his thoughts, he realized that the first thing he needed to do was contact the authorities. He shut off the TV, turned, lifted the receiver of the landline phone on the small table next to him, and began dialing 911. Then the voice called from the bath. Bertram, are you there? He froze, his fingers still hovering over the one button on the phone's receiver. He reminded himself there were no such things as ghosts. He dialed the one, then he heard the waters stirring, followed by the faint sound of feet sliding over the tile floor toward the bathroom door. In his mind's eye, Bertram watched the doorknob slowly turn and heard the telltale creak of the door hinges. The wet footsteps squished as they dragged down the hall and toward the living room. Bertram laid the receiver on the table and stared straight ahead at the darkened TV screen. He could see his own reflection and the living room around him. His peripheral vision detected the form stepping out of the hall. He stayed focused on the TV mirror. He might lose what little sanity he had left if he looked directly at her. He panted as the body wrapped in a white bathrobe sauntered past him and sat down in the chair next to him. Bertram, I feel funny, she said. I hope I didn't have a stroke or something. Emmeline looked over to him. Bertram, what's wrong with you? Look at me when I'm talking to you. Bertram worked up enough courage to swivel his head toward her like a wobbly animatronic. When he saw that his wife was very much alive 
and not some revenant haunting him, his body relaxed and his heart rate returned to near normal. Baby? He asked with more relief than fear. God of Moses, darling. I thought you'd gone and died in the bathtub. Died in the bathtub? What's gotten into you, you old fool? She smiled and snickered at him. You was in the tub for a while, so I wouldn't check on you. You weren't breathing or moving or nothing. When I touched you, you slumped over like a loose fence post. Are you sure you're all right? Yes, Bertram. I think I might remember dying. I probably just fainted. Them new blood pressure pills Doc Melbourne has me on has been giving me the woozies. I'll call him tomorrow and get that straightened out. She shot a quick glance at the antique clock on the mantel and said, Good gracious, would you look at the time? Have you eaten anything? Well, of course, Emmeline. The first thing I thought of when I figured you was dead was to go into the kitchen and stuff my pie hole. Oh, Bertram. She mewed through one of the loving smiles he always found endearing. You must be starved. I'll whip you up some fried cube steak and mashed potatoes. Ain't you hungry too? You know how much dying can wear a body out. Ha ha, ain't you a riot. You know, for some reason, I ain't hungry. Well, how about you get on to bed and rest yourself then? I've got more of a hankering for a peanut butter and nanner sandwich. All right then, I am feeling pretty run down. I'll see you in the morning. I sure hope so. Emmeline got up from her chair, stood over him and kissed him on top of his balding head before heading off to bed. Sweet Jesus, how her lips are cold. A good half hour before he even got himself was set to awaken, the rooster crowed. Bertram sat up in bed, rubbed his eyes, and swung his legs over the side. He drew in the familiar fragrance wafting in from the kitchen. Bertram loved the smell of freshly brewed coffee and bacon in the morning. He threw on some fresh overalls and made a beeline to his breakfast. He leaned over the stove in the kitchen and sniffed the frying pans that created what he liked to think of as the morning miracle. He poured himself a mug of hot black coffee and sat down at the small table by the kitchen window where he was greeted by the glorious sight of one of Emmeline's life-altering breakfasts. He was about to place the napkin in his lap when it dawned on him that Emmeline wasn't buzzing around the way she typically did. His stomach lurched at the thought that she may have passed out again. Hey, honey, where are you at? I'm down here. Emmeline hollered from the root cellar where she stored her delicious homemade jellies. Soon the cellar's two heavy doors slammed shut. Bertram heard her grunting as she climbed up the three stairs of the side porch. Darling, are you okay? Do you need some help? No, I'm good. Just needed to grab a fresh jar of jelly. Emmeline replied. Bertram started loading up his plate with scrambled eggs. He heard the squeal of the long spring on the screen door stretching. Come on, old woman, or I'll start the blessing without you. Emmeline scooted past him as he saturated his eggs with Tabasco sauce. He was stretching for the bacon just as she was sitting down. She reached across the table and placed the jelly at the center, next to the biscuit's covered bowl. The jar was her strawberry blend. Bertram read the personalized note on the label affixed to the front. Strapping strawberry. Main ingredient, love. He smiled as if he were reading the sentiment for the first time. I don't know what's up with me this morning. My joints feel so stiff. Emmeline complained. Oh now, Emmeline, you know neither of us is exactly a spring chick. Bertram looked at her. She had dark circles under her slightly milky eyes. Purple veins crisscrossed her upper torso. Bertram, what is it? Are you all right? You look like you've seen a ghost. Bertram swallowed hard. Emmeline, baby, have you looked in a mirror? No, I just threw on my dress and got about my business. I didn't have the energy to go comb my hair or brush my teeth. Besides, who's there to try and impress way out here anyways? Speaking of teeth, my jaw feels tight. It's making it hard to talk. Do you think I might have gotten a tick bite? Those things can cause all kinds of bad symptoms. Bertram didn't feel like eating anymore. I think we ought to get you in the truck and go to the ER over in Campbell. That's nearly an hour from here. Just let me see if I can stomach some food. Then I'll go take some aspirin and lie down. I'll be all right. Here, 
Let me see if you got a fever first. Bertram felt her forehead. He snatched his hand back. Bertram, what is it? Do I have a temperature or not? Sweetie, you don't have no temperature at all. You're colder than an Eskimo's nose. Are you sure you don't want me to rush you to the hospital in Campbell? There's no telling what you might have caught. No, I'm too tired to even walk out to the truck. Just help me get back to bed. I don't think I can hold anything down after all. We'll see how I feel later. All right, if you're sure. Bertram took her arm. He nearly yelped. It felt as if her arm had turned into an unyielding rubber. When he finally got her to the bedroom, he began unbuttoning the back of her dress. He noticed it was damp, and her skin had a slight sheen to it. After he lowered her onto the bed, he covered her up and kissed her frigid forehead before heading to the living room to give all of this a good think. Throughout the morning and early afternoon, Bertram checked on her four times. Each time she was sleeping. Worn out by questions and concerns, he nodded off in the recliner. A while later, he awoke with a start and saw the early evening's faint shadows beginning to take shape on the living room's wall. He had drifted off earlier in the afternoon, which meant Emmeline hadn't been checked on for hours. Bertram gave a slight grunt as he hauled himself up and out of his chair. He was just beginning to get acclimated to alertness when he heard a gurgling voice cry out from the back bedroom. Bertram! Her voice sounded like it was underwater. Bertram was running down the hall when the odd smell hit him. It was like rotten fruit and spoiled meat. He charged through the bedroom door, flipped on the light switch, and blocked his howl with his palm. Bertram, she asked, do I look odd to you? I feel different from this morning. What do you think's going on? Bertram had no response for the waxy corpse sitting on the edge of the bed. Then his attention shifted to the stomach-churning stench emanating from the thick pus oozing from the bopping blisters covering her reddish body. I feel sick. Will you help get me to the bathroom? Bertram stood there, gawking at her. He didn't know if he should run screaming from the house or call an ambulance. Bertram, help me, she pleaded. He walked to the bed. Emmeline held up a waterlogged arm, and Bertram grimaced as he took hold of it. He began lifting her up to a standing position and felt the top layer of her skin slip a little. His repulsion made him pause. Bertram, get me to the toilet. It was enough to snap him back. After helping Emmeline up, he stepped back a bit, but held his arms out to catch her if she fell, though he dreaded having to touch her again. Once he had directed her into the bathroom, she shuffled toward the toilet. She bent forward slightly and vomited up copious amounts of blackish blood and small chunky pieces. Feeling his own gorge rising, Bertram said, I'm so sorry, as he dashed from the bathroom and out to the side porch where he did some puking of his own. As he was finishing, it gradually dawned on him that he had left his ailing wife alone in the bathroom dealing with her own fear and discomfort. Wiping his mouth with the back of his hand, he composed himself as best he could and ventured back inside. The only thing worse than Emmeline's hideous appearance was the horrendous smell of decaying flesh that now permeated the back of the house. He grabbed a handkerchief from a pocket in his overalls and covered his nose and mouth. Emmeline, where are you, sugar? Bathroom, the croaking voice replied. She was hunched over the porcelain sink, her darkened hands gripping the sides. Oh, Bertram, she whispered. Bertram approached the sink. He couldn't see Emmeline's face. Her oily hair had fallen forward over her brow. Bloody teeth clogged the drain. I think we might be looking at more than some tick bite or fainting spell. The conclusion he was coming to unleashed a bevy of goosebumps all over his body. She wasn't merely ill. She was a withering corpse. Bertram had seen enough dead farm animals. Emmeline was just as gone as they had been. He had no idea what to do, think, or say. Then the small crumb of rationality told him that the first thing he needed to do was become more practical. Crying in confusion would not help. He could no longer think of Emmeline as his beloved high school sweetheart and wife of over 50 years. She was now a body he had to deal with. His first course of action was to get her out of the house. Emmeline, sweetness, let's get you on the porch. I think we both could use some fresh air. 
She remained still at first and then made four small turns to her left until she was facing the bathroom doorway. You want me to help you? Bertram asked. He was relieved when she didn't answer. Once she made it to the porch, Emmeline managed to bend her knees enough to lower herself down onto one of the rocking chairs. Bertram attempted to conceal the look of disgust on his face about her joints loud cracking as she sat down. Foamy blood leaked from her mouth and nose. They say there's dignity in death, Bertram thought, but there ain't nothing dignified about my wife right now. He felt the need to cover her wretched body with something. Sugar, would you like a blanket? Emmeline nodded ever so slightly, her neck making the cringe-worthy cracking sound again. Bertram pulled in a deep breath. Holding on to it for as long as possible, he jogged to the bedroom closet for the blanket. Once he was back outside, he tenderly wrapped the blanket around her and sat in the other rocking chair. Neither said a word. They stared out across the yard at the fading springtime sun as it slid softly and colorfully behind the tree line. Bertram rocked back and forth. He tried desperately to direct his mind toward any other place but the porch he was sharing with the dead woman. Bertram let his gaze wash over the front property, corralled by a long stretch of wire fencing. He was rapt as he took notice of the straight rows of neatly planted corn. They reminded him of a battalion of soldiers standing at attention. God, how I love the country life. It surely does agree with me. But the merciful distraction dissipated as his thoughts circled back to Emmeline. He recalled fondly the acreage portion that she had claimed, the magical place that ran along the north side of the house that gave the fruit bushes their first breath of glorious life. She used the berries she grew to create her wondrous and delectable delights. His lips trembled as he remembered the unique labels she made for each jar. She'd give each flavor a catchy name, like Big Bad Blueberry, Betcha like em Blackberry, or Really Red Raspberry. And just as she had done on the label for the strawberry jelly she had served at breakfast, she always finished out the stickers with the affectionate phrase, Main Ingredient, Love. As the hours wore on, Emmeline's wet breathing slowed. Her once bold eyes grew dull and distant. Despite his effort to stay awake with her, Bertram eventually fell into a deep and uneasy sleep. He was so drained that he slept past the rooster for one of the very few times in his adult life. He was awakened by a loud buzzing. Emmeline was still gazing well past nowhere. Her eyes had receded deep into their sockets. The buzzing that Bertram heard was the numerous flying insects rushing in and out of her open mouth, invading her nose and ears. Her greenish body had bloated. It looked as though her stomach was set to burst. Due to the grotesque swelling, her blanket had slipped off. For Emmeline's sake, Bertram tried to remain stoic. It would be cruel to let her witness her husband's revulsion. His disordered mind made it difficult for him to decide on what he should do for his wife at this awful moment. He did know that he would never leave her with the relentless flies and their maggots. More importantly, he would never allow anyone else to see her in her current ghastly state. The authorities be damned. I'm fading, Burr, she mumbled. What can I do, darling? Tell me what I can do for you. She struggled mightily to make herself understood. Put me back in the tub, please. Let me try and wash this mess off of me. It was hard for Bertram to watch the filthy insects pushed out of her mouth as she spoke. It seemed evil and profane, and it brought about a wave of anger. I'll go get the bath ready, he said. I'll be back in a jiffy. When he returned to the porch, he had his handkerchief tied around the lower half of his face. Then he placed one arm under Emmeline's knees, now stiff with rigor mortis, and the other across her shifting shoulder blades and carried her to the bathroom. The muscles in his lower back strained as he placed her down into the water's warm comfort. He stood up straight to loosen his back muscles and noticed that his arms were sticky and stained. Do you want me to help wash you off? No. Just leave me. Bertram shuddered as he realized that this was likely the last time he would ever hear his wife's voice. Call if you need anything. He went back out to the front porch to clear his head and allow the tears to purge his heart. 
He waited there for a very long time, but Emmeline still hadn't called for him. When he couldn't take the silence and worry any longer, he recovered his mouth and nose with his handkerchief and returned to the bathroom. Emmeline was slumped over, just as she had been the first time he found her. Her skin was turning black, and there was a slimy film on the surface of the water. Worse yet, her body was beginning to liquefy. The odor that rippled through his mask was the worst by far. Bertram opened a window and then bolted back outside to wretch. Lord, please help me. What in the world am I going to do? He shouted, but heaven was silent. Should he now call the authorities? And if he did, what would he tell them? What might they make of his wife's decomposed body? Would they think him a ghoul and lock him away? There was going to be an investigation and many questions he couldn't possibly answer. Bertram needed a place to think. He walked around to the side of the house and stood near Emmeline's garden where her prized crop flourished. He paced anxiously, frazzled and useless, hoping for an idea. Then he abruptly stopped. As Bertram gazed upon the columns of ripened berries, an inexplicable feeling of calmness enveloped him. The garden's peacefulness brought clarity, allowing him to ponder a few simple ideas rather than trudge through a complicated maze of elaborate plans. The decision he made felt not so much correct as it did proper. For Bertram, this was now a sacred place of remembrance, a place where a woman's love nurtured the rich brown earth that had yielded so much sweetness and beauty. Now he knew what in the world he was going to do. He let her sit in the tub for over a week so nature could finish the job it had screwed up before. Then he dug a hole out by her garden and began pouring her remains into it. When he got down to the last of it, Bertram picked up the small jar he had brought with him and filled it. He screwed on the two-piece metal lid, took a pen from one of his overalls chest pockets, and scribbled some words on the blank label. Bertram carried the jar down to its final resting place. There it would serve as a small monument to a love that would continue far beyond its 50-plus years of earthly existence. He said a few words of prayer, then solemnly ascended the stairs of the root cellar. He lowered its doors as if they were the lid of a coffin. There in the darkness, on a row of tall racks, sat a jar of dark jelly. Written on the white label were the words, Amazing Emmeline. Main ingredient? Love. December 25th, 2018 was the worst day the town of Brigantine had seen since its founding. People call it the Christmas of the Lost. My heart still stammers just writing about it. Hundreds of parents laid out gifts under their Christmas trees the night before. Each parent woke up to an identical scene as when they went to sleep. Cookies and milk were untouched. Stockings bulged with undisturbed treats and gifts rested in their places under the Christmas trees, cold from the lack of children's joy. My wife Nina and I were no exception. I remember us tiptoeing past our son's bedroom as we carried his gifts from Santa down the hall. Nina was tipsy on eggnog and I had a bit of a holiday buzz going myself. We giggled and shushed each other as we stumbled through the house. It's one of my best memories because it's the last time we ever laughed together. Hell, I can't even remember if we've laughed at all since then. Ronnie was sleeping in his bed as he always was. I know this because my wife and I bickered about her going in there to give him a good night kiss. Looking back now, I thank God that she won that battle. It brings me something close to a hint of solace to know that some of his last moments in this house were spent under his mother's love. We set up his tricycle, placing the largest yellow bow atop the handlebars that we could find. Nina's mother's tradition dictated that we place an orange at the bottom of his stocking, but the rest was filled with little toys and candy. I groaned as she handed me the full plate of cookies. Ugh, why did we always make so many again? I joked. Because it's fun. I don't know about you, but when Ronnie and I are making them, a small part of me actually believes they'll be eaten by Father Christmas. 
she blushed as she placed an amber strand of hair behind her dainty ear. The thick peanut butter cups atop the cookies were killing me that year. I remember choking on my own saliva, turned into a biting syrup by sugar. We got it done, though, leaving exactly one cookie uneaten for Ronnie to sneak in the morning. The milk, however, was all mine. We awoke to the sounds of sirens and the sun shining through our windows. Nina's bedside clock read 9.18 a.m. As much as I tried to fight it, a cold chill enveloped each cell in my body. We knew something was wrong. It's not normal for Ronnie to sleep past 7 o'clock, but especially not on Christmas. Nina took off running to his room on instinct, fearing that he had left the house and gotten hit by a car or injured. I held my breath, praying to hear his sleepy little voice. But so far, my wife's calls have gone unanswered. Chris, Ronnie's not here, she yelled down the hall. What do you mean he's not here? You haven't even checked the living room. Chris, I'm telling you, our boy's not fucking here. She choked out through sobs. Her footsteps boomed through the house and I heard the front door slam shut as she left. My breath started coming in faster and larger puffs as I tried to process the quickly unfolding situation. The robe I wore the night before was disgusting on my skin. Nothing felt right. It's like at that moment, I already knew that the joy in my life was over. I just couldn't accept it. Thousands of scenarios invaded my rationality from the corners I had done so well at keeping them hidden in. Each fear I've ever had as a parent that was always out of reach for someone like me was now all too tangible. When I opened my front door, I was met with an overwhelming number of sobs and wails. Dozens of people on our street were outside of their homes. Most of them were crying hysterically. Some wore blank expressions of shock. Others demanded to search every person's home on the block who didn't have children. I held my wife as she tumbled to the ground. An officer had told her every child in the county had gone missing Christmas Eve night. My brain fought with itself as to how I should feel. On one hand, hundreds of children kidnapped at the same time would be hard to house and even harder to hide. On the other hand, though, the irrational part of my mind told me that something unnatural had happened altogether and none of us would ever see our children again. As the months went on and the seasons changed, most of the parents in town had reached the same heart-rendering conclusion until November. Nina and I were still married, though we slept in separate bedrooms now. She got on this kick right away about trying for another baby, which I was, am, fully against. First off, I felt that if we had another child, we would be replacing Ronnie. Even worse, we'd be accepting the fact that he was never coming back. We didn't know that. I always held out heartbreaking hope that they'd find him, find all of the missing kids. Furthermore, if something in this town was taking children, I certainly didn't want to give them a new target. Anyway, one morning Nina's screams woke me from a heavily medicated sleep. Chris, it's Ronnie, he's home. The covers are thrown in a corner of the room as I spring out of my now cold bed. Each step closer to my son fills my heart with a happiness I feared I no longer possess. The long lost and dearly missed sound of his voice stops me cold. Whoever is talking to Nina is not our little boy. His voice sounds low and detached, like it's being run through a voice synthesizer. My stomach heaves when I finally bring myself to finish taking the steps to his bedroom. A mutilated, mangled body lay in the bed that was once meant for our son. Don't get me wrong, he is alive and healthy. He just came back... wrong. His face is a mingle of features that seems random at best. It was as if Picasso had genetically designed a human being and brought them to life. Licorice whip braids of pink scarring surround his every joint, knuckle, and limb. One leg is shorter than the other by six inches. His left arm is thinner and four shades lighter than his other left arm. The right eye, placed haphazardly on his face, is one of the only qualities that proves to me it's really him. The eye on the left looks like it belongs to someone else entirely. Once again, the street is thick with police officers, but fire rescue is here this time too. 
Parents are holding disfigured children as they're laid on stretchers, each one yelling about how they're fine and don't need treatment. I caught eyes with the little girl who lived across the street from us, and I recognized one of them as my son's. Whatever happened, it's as if each child was put into a machine, had their DNA all mixed and randomized, then spit back out. The children walk, talk, eat, and play like they always have. It's almost impossible to tell who is who anymore. The next year, I heard whispers of a reckoning of sorts. The town leaders and religious figures had labeled these children, some of them their own, as abominations. Plans began for a massive event to return the children to the melting pot from which they came. Nina and I decided to get him the hell out of here. By the time they noticed a child was missing, we would be long gone. Surely there was somewhere in the world that would greet Ronnie with acceptance and love. We were just happy to have him back. This Christmas morning, as Ronnie opened his simple gifts in our new home under our tree, the doorbell rang. An abandoned gift sat lovingly on our doormat. It was a rectangular box wrapped in gold and red paper with a large green bow and tag perched atop it. Inside lay a set of light blue children's gloves made up of two left hands. The note on the tag read, To Ronnie, from Your Secret Santa, we're watching. If you enjoyed tonight's story, hosted by yours truly, Paul J. McSorley, you can search my name on Chilling Tales for Dark Nights on YouTube for additional previous stories. If you'd like to hear more lengthy tales, be sure to take a look at my audiobooks. Available now on audible.com or just visit paulsbooks.net. That's P-A-U-L-S-B-O-O-K-S dot net. You can also find me personally on Facebook and Twitter. And with that, listeners, our weekly journey into the psyche has just about come to a close. But before we go, I'd like to take a moment to thank you for joining us for tonight's episode and remind you to take a moment to stop by our iTunes page and leave Chilling Tales for Dark Nights a five-star review and a kind word. And follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram if you haven't already. And while you're at it, please remember to stop by our Apple Podcast page or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts and subscribe. The charts are based on subscriptions, not listens. So if you haven't subscribed yet, I'd really appreciate it. I'm your host for Fear from the Heartland, Paul J. McSorley. I've enjoyed the titillation tonight. Ooh, there's that word again. Thank you for joining me. Hope to see you again next week at Fear from the Heartland.
chilling tales for dark nights.